and welcome to Useful Idiots. I'm Katie Helper. And I'm Matt Taibbi. And how are you this week? I'm okay, you? Tired. Tired, yeah. 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 You have I'm a old. mailman look. You <laughs> I have a mailman older look? than you did last week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess so. What's, I'm like, what I, is I, it I, with I, the hat? It's a mailman ish. It is mailman. It's it's a it's a Japanese baseball hat actually, but it's but you're right with the blue. Oh really? Yeah, kind of. Oh, that's kinda. what it is. Yeah, it's funny. I didn't actually know. I knew there was a mailman vibe, but now you just explained it to me. It's the blue hat and the blue shirt, right? Right, right. It's that color combination. Yes. I, I, that, that's not a career option that I ever uh, really considered. Uh, you never mail did service. it for a story. Uh, mail I never, service. I never did. I never did it for a story. I, re- I read the hmm. Bukowski book, but that's about it. Well, yeah. I like it. It's a vision. Matt Taibbi, a vision of blue, as he's often <laughs> called. Uh, what do we have going on in the world this week? Well, we have a great show for you today with Norman Finkelstein, the um, eminent uh, historian. Well, actually, eminent, the eminent political scientist. Um, he's written uh, over 10 books, very, very prolific, very controversial in the best way. Really, this relates to why we are no longer with Rolling Stone. It's been a while since we gave you kind of a breadcrumb to lead you to the gingerbread cookie house of our split. Um, if you can follow those breadcrumbs. Anyway, so <laughs> thanks, Matt. For Matt, Matt, Matt was giving his. Uh, I was sorry, I was doing the met- metaphor calculator. He was doing the metaphor, yeah, yeah. How'd I do? Uh, how I'm many, still working how it many out. How ginger, yeah. gingerbread men thumbs up? <laughs> do they have thumbs, gingerbread men? No, that's a good question. That's, that's Viewers, today. Listeners, check it out. Tell us. Yeah, I'm let gonna us look know. right now because you know metaphors okay. have to agree. So, so one of the reasons you know we've had a couple of uh, we've revealed things uh, bit by bit to keep you guys w- coming to the show. But one of the reasons that we are no longer with Rolling Stone, besides um, a contract dispute over Assad uh, being our third host, uh, over Yemeni child being our fourth host, over salary disputes, um, and a big debate over the chemistry between me and Assad or lack thereof. Uh, we also ha- aren't, we're not going to lie. We also months ago when we first tried to book this guest, we were threatened. We had our lives and our livelihoods. This is the first time we're opening up about our lives being threatened before we just talked about our livelihoods, but this actually got us. I had a dog this, head. This was so, t- so, so top secret that even I didn't know about it. I wanted to protect you. I tried to protect you, Matt. I didn't want to upset you. Shit. Um, yeah, this was, you see, that was the alarm. And my alarm was, I have my Siri set. So if I'm ever tortured under duress and, and my Siri hears me starting to tell Matt Taibbi, it, it gives me an alarm. To, right. To remind. remind you. Yeah. To remind me. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. this was a top. I didn't really, you look, you had a lot, your ties with Rolling Stone were a lot longer. I was trying to protect you. I didn't want you and your family alarmed. But um, if you notice those cars circling around your house, since a couple since our split and now and you thought it was just a curious neighbor it's actually security that i provided it's called the finkelstein oh, right. protection plan right right yeah. i i see it all it all fits now yeah yeah it all now it's all the pieces are coming together yeah uh incidentally no uh gingerbread men don't have thumbs oh they don't really. have thumbs okay yeah. well so that was gingerbread arms two gingerbread arms way up way up except they tend to be down i don't know you'd have to well, turn them upside down to make them yeah way up. or we could do remember um isn't that bailey remember the bailey arms the liz holy bailey arms right yeah yeah, yeah. the yeah. gingerbread holy right but then you have the problem of it not agreeing with the whole breadcrumbs gingerbread house thing all oh, right we need that agreement um right, was all right we'll figure it out it was so I mean, the payoff was so good, though. We have to, we have to somehow make the the layup even better. Right. Yeah. Right. You get it. Everybody gets it. Yeah, everyone we gets it. It's funny. I'm not on any sub- illicit substance right now. No. No, you're not. Although I feel no, I but I feel like it's a nice combo of like um, Ambien and some upper. Like I feel like the way I'm coming across is is some, you know this better than I do, Matt. Um, so you can correct me. But what is the vibe? Because I feel like I'm kind of being slow, but like, I feel like I've, I look like I've taken uppers, but also some kind of downers. I don't mean physically look, but something about the way I'm talking. So like Ambien and Ritalin, something like that? I don't know. Yeah. You tell me. 
Um, yeah, that could work. This is, this is like half asking, half asking you for your advice, half a setup. I feel like the way I'm doing it, you tell me, you'd know. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Oh yes. Yeah, so Full circle, guys. I'm not advertising for them, but I am drinking a ginger beer. Oh, and the beer is an illicit substance? Is that the no, idea? No, sorry, gingerbread. I'm sorry. In my head, you oh, see, in my, see. Dr my drug addled head, it made a lot of sense. Gosling's Diet Ginger Beer, non alcoholic diet soft drink with a little seal. So if you want to sponsor this show, you know what to do. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So gingerbread, ginger beer, it all, it all yeah. fits. It all, yeah. Uh, yeah. oh, but, right. So you were just, just to finish, finish up. Oh, yeah. We were canceled for um, proposing Norman Finkelstein as a guest because he's very controversial. And uh, now after a great delay, we're going to experience some of that controversy in today's. Yeah, episode. exactly. So, yeah. So because uh, we signed an agreement with Rolling Stone saying we wouldn't have him on within a certain number of months. And that time is now up. Right. Exactly. So uh, this week, lots of stuff happened. Um, oh, and before we go anywhere, actually, it looks like Matt Wilson is sending us some breaking news about Giuliani. What is this? Uh oh, wait. Ooh, Rudy Giuliani suspended from practicing law in New York State. Uncontroverted evidence that Giuliani communicated demonstrably false and misleading statements to courts, lawmakers, and the public at large in his capacity as lawyer for former Donald, President Donald Trump. And the Trump campaign in connection with Trump's failed effort at re-election in 2020. Wow. So that is big news. So I'd be interesting to know what that is. Come on the show, Rudy. Yeah. I guess it's the bar, like, is this the Bar Association? Oh, it's an appellate court. You think it was the Borat movie? I doubt it was that. Let's get the New York Times story. Hang on a second. Oh my God, Matt's going to lose his Substack audience when they know that. You're no. going to lose your stuff. I'm kidding, because you're going to the New York Times. Oh, okay. So this is him. It's because his, because of his legal challenge to the election results, uh, arguing without merit that the vote had been rife with fraud and that voting machines had been rigged. Why aren't you allowed to say that? I mean, it's a lie, I would say, right? But is he in any official position? No, he's he's a lawyer. So you you can't. Oh, he did it right, right. He did it as a lawyer. I forgot, not just as a pundit, right? You can't make a um a false statement to the court, right? Uh, but the appellate court's talking about him making false statements to the public. Uh, Giuliani's lawyers, John Leventhal and Barry Kamen, said in a statement they were disappointed that the panel took action before holding a hearing on the allegations. This is unprecedented, as we believe that our, our client does not pose a present danger to the public interest. Uh, we believe that once the issues are fully exported to hearing, Mr. Giuliani will be reinstated as a valued member of the legal profession that he has served so well in his many capacities for so many years. It's hard to really comment on this without knowing exactly what it, I mean, I guess I guess if it has to do with the voter fraud theory, then it, may, it makes sense. Right. Like if you if the it's similar to the, the Dominion story, if you were arguing that they were breaking the machines, you don't have proof of that. That's that's you know, that's not permissible. That's why the OAN and, and Fox had to retract right. those stories. But we have to find out what that is before 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 really knowing what, what's up there. Yeah, well, I have to, I have to, I, I'm going to have to, I actually, you know how you said you didn't want to comment on this, but until you, you read up on it more, I mm -hmm. actually can't comment on this ever at all. And I'm going to explain why I'm going to just put add this, put a link in the zoom, just want to be fully transparent. Uh, you'll see that that is indeed. Are you holding his tie? No, no, no. But you'll see that that is indeed Katie Halper and Rudy Giuliani. So I obviously have to recuse myself from any potential coverage of any stories involving him um, as someone who's been photographed with him. I'm, this is from 2008 Denver DNC. I'm wearing an Obama for president camo hat. That picture of you with Hannity is a little suggestive. Yeah, I, I guess it is. Let me, what's the other one? Well, I mean, he put his hand on my shoulder. I mean, I think, what happened in that story afterward? Nothing. I saw him at a bar at the RNC asking for a photo. I can't remember if my friend took it or I took it. I also had my photo taken with Breitbart, Herman Cain, Bill Barr, but he's not quite as well known. Sometimes people try to own me as like a right winger because I got my photo taken with these people. Well, that's not right. I mean, it's just funny. It's like, it's yeah. I, I have an even deeper personal ooh, connection to Giuliani, but I cannot reveal it on this What show. is it? Is it what? you guys met at Putin's house? Uh, yes, that's what it was. Exactly. But yeah, that's 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 pretty big news. I'm, I'm still a little confused about it, who exactly did the suspending. Was it the appellate court or the bar association or what? But um, um, a New York court suspended him. 
due to making false and misleading statements about the election loss. The suspension is a stunning blow to Giuliani has since last November made false claims about the legitimacy of the election of President Joe Biden. But again, like in what? Yeah, it says following disciplinary yeah. proceedings by whom? By Weird. It uh... also comes as Giuliani's under criminal investigation by that same federal prosecutor's office in Manhattan in connection with his work in Ukraine. Yeah, okay. So there's this the CNN story. Uh, Giuliani or lawyers representing him is set to be in court in D.C. Thursday over Thursday afternoon over a defamation lawsuit from the vote management company Dominion Voting Systems, which is suing Giuliani and others for statements they made alleging election fraud. So maybe it has something to do with that. Right. In which case, you know, I, it makes total sense. Yeah. And I just I just makes total sense. And I also really want to just make sure that Giuliani hears this. Rudy, if you're watching this, you know me, you trust me, we've had our photo taken together. And I really suggest that you come on the show. And, you know, we, you could get that useful idiots show bump. It could really take you places. And I, I want to, I don't like to gloat. We would be remiss if we didn't talk about this week's useful idiot debunk. What's the opposite of a bump? Fall? The it's chasm? like it's, The chasm, yeah. Because you know who lost this week in his run for mayor? And I can't help but point out that he did not come on the show once during his mayoral run. Andrew hmm. Yang. It was kind of unexpected that he do so poorly and i think that that you know what i think matt and i think i know what you think i know and i know mm. what i know and that's that it is very possible that one of the decisive factors in his stunning loss he didn't win the presidential primary but he did well and what did he also do during the presidential primary he came on our show yeah, yeah. he came on our show yes anyway he came on the show he did well he doesn't come on the show what happens not even top three. Right. That's your word that I'm, I hate to say I told you so, Andrew. Yeah, it, and, it, it, it's actually it's kind of worth talking about what happened to Andrew Yang's campaign. Yeah. In New York, because he. Yeah. Could have been so different, Andrew. We could have been talking about it with you ahead of time. Was it was it his failure to name a Jay-Z song in that one interview? What was it? Yeah. What was it? I mean. I haven't looked at the breakdown yet, but Adams is really, we should have Eric Adams come on the show. Yeah. Paperboy Prince, we should have him on the show, actually. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Adams really is, is terrible. Terrible is a relative term. Terrible compared to what? I mean, because why exactly? I think you know why, Matt. Because he's because he's not Yang? <laughs> no, because he, he's engages in placard abuse. Oh. That's a big right. thing, by the way, according to Ross Barkin. But uh, I don't remember if he talked about it in this interview or not. Make sure you guys check out the Substack only uh, interview we did with Ross Barkin, uh, where we talk about hot takes about defund the police. But um, uh, why is he terrible? Because he's plays the identity politics thing really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, he's like an austerity guy. I mean, they all suck. It was really kind of remarkable. This is like the best we got. What the hell did Bernie do? I'm sorry. You know, I love Bernie, but where's the infrastructure? The mm. progressive movement infrastructure. Well, they cannibalized two of their own candidates in this, in right. this race. All right, Morales and, um, and, Stringer. and uh, Stringer, yeah. The Yang thing was really interesting because the the New York sort of media turned on him in a way yeah. that was that was like super aggressive from the very beginning and, it, and i'm i guess i'm just not in tune enough with new york politics and and media to really know what that was all about was yeah. it because was it because there were the the other reporters had markers to call in for the other candidates Maybe. or yeah i guess he didn't have those institutional ties that like made him actually probably much less terrible than other candidates but he didn't really play it outsider enough i feel like that was the issue like he wasn't he 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 played the like disruptor thing thinking outside the box but he barely even i mean he dropped the you know the, the problem was he kind of was afraid of his own shadow i think like, well did he did he, he even mention um the um a, a universal basic income how no, much did but he mention it during the not really I, I don't think much at all but the thing is for for yang he probably would have done well in a in a general election right the, the strategy for him in a primary was was a little bit confused like if he's not going to get the 
the institutional backing of the New York Times and all those other right. and all the money, then what is he going to do? Is he going to run as a as a raging leftist slash progressive? That's not who he is, right? So right, yeah, yeah. When there's so many people running, it's hard to distinguish yourself, right? Also, like if it's just you and one other or two others, maybe. Right, right. But I mean, he he had a a name recognition thing yeah. that, that that should have been uh should have carried him but he just took so much so much of a beating uh early on in the race yeah, it seemed like it's it's it seemed like both both the kind of backroom political establishment types in new york and the kind of insurgent uh progressive activists <laughs> hated hated him right for different reasons yeah for different reasons yeah, yeah. so mm. yeah he didn't have a base because it's so different obviously when you're running as an outsider and you have no chance, you do really like he did very well, given that he came from nowhere. Right. Seemingly. But then when you're actually running for something that you can win, it's <laughs> different. Yeah. Yeah, you can exactly. Potentially win. Yeah. So uh, also shout out to New York Times for their most ridiculous endorsement ever yet. I don't know. No, I guess they should next time they, in every race. They should just endorse no matter what race. They should just do a Garcia, Warren, Klobuchar endorsement, no matter what. Mm -hmm. they should mm -hmm. just have that that like you know the holy trinity because right. they had that double endorsement of warren and klobuchar which is so ridiculous i still can't get over that that was one of the most the the longest least interesting pieces of text that you'll ever read like they really really labored to just to to try to find a way to talk themselves into what they were doing and, yeah. then, and and it wasn't convincing and then and then, and then why because because it was it was it was so clear that they were going to throw away their endorsement on somebody who had no chance they seemed torn between trying to explain why they were doing that like i don't know it was it was a very strange thing it, it, yeah. ba but basically the what they should have just done is we're not endorsing bernie and here's why yeah they should have just done we're not endorsing bernie here are a, a bunch of hyperlinks to some articles by every reporter at the New York Times, especially uh, Sidney Ember, which right. makes the case for us. Right. Yeah. Any exactly. questions, please follow up with Sidney Ember. Right. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, we're endorsing whoever does eventually win. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Unless they did burning. want, they didn't, right. They did make history of endorsing a woman, half, of, they endorsed half a woman of color. Right. She's what? Actually, half of an eighth of a woman of color. Because you divide it by one, right? You divide it by two, right? She's one. Warren? Yeah, because she didn't get the full endorsement. So whatever her Native American ancestry is. So she's, they, they, they endorsed the 16th of a woman yeah. of color? So only 15 more to go. And is then that, it'll be like they endorsed a woman of color. Is that right? So they endorse the 16th of a woman of color. All right. So they made history doing that. They did, yeah. I mean, That's to be good. fair, she is obviously scans as a woman. Of, when she walks around this, you know, in the world, everyone thinks she's a woman of color. So. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, her appearance just screams that. Yeah. Maybe that's what they were counting on. OK, so so, yeah, that happened. So uh, Yang didn't win. Uh, could have won if he had come on the show. If he could have won, if he had come on the show, he actually he actually kind of sort of agreed to come on the show and then didn't so i mean it's that kind of honestly i can't trust someone like that to be running my city not this city yeah. and matt when you asked what happened people did they call in favors look i called in a bunch of favors i said look i don't want to say it's not my place i just want you to know that he kind of promised to come on this podcast he wasn't he didn't hold his his word it's up to you if you want to you know so fuck him, him is that what you're saying well, it's up to you if you want to kneecap him, but I just want you to know that as a New Yorker, um, it's he, that was violence to me as a New Yorker. I still, I still like Andrew, so I'm, 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 I'm not going to go there. Well, you know what? Look, that's good. I, I like him. I just feel bad because I didn't want to have to ruin his electoral chances. But you he's know. one of our funnier guests, actually. Remember, he is remember, funny, yeah. You know, which we which do is that why show it's so heartbreaking. When he was talking about how you know why did it take so long for him to come on here and, and he was imitating us and he was saying yeah geez yang you've been on shows that were a lot less cool you've been on a lot less cool shit than this right yeah which is which is funny it was it was kind of a diss of both of us right but all, it, it all was, of us. right all of us and we could have been having so many funny we could share, have shared so many laughs with the mayor with mayor right. yang it could have yeah, been so different if he had just come on the show 
<laughs> We'd all be smoking cigars right now. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Play, and, and buying drapes for Gracie Mansion. But, exactly. But alas, it didn't alas. happen. All right, so four food groups, uh, Democrats suck, Republicans suck, isn't that weird, isn't that terrible? Uh, Democrats suck this week. I guess it's pretty easy. We have a, we had a situation with Democratic Senator Sheldon Whitehouse from the state of Rhode Island, who uh, I guess he sort of got buttonholed by someone about his membership in the Ida Lewis Yacht Club in Newport, um, which I've seen, by the way. Uh, oh, really? What's it like? Uh, I've never actually been in it but i i I think i've i think i've seen it from the outside all right so he's he's the member i guess it might as well just read this um this news story from the daily mail always better i guess to read the the, the british uh so democratic they have this this objectivity from afar that we don't have here yet right they have a a view on us that's that's more interesting than our own view of ourselves. So Democratic Senator Sheldon Whitehouse defended membership in uh, a second club that lacks diversity and says he won't resign, but vows to, quote, build a more inclusive membership on Wednesday. Um, that's a confusing lead. Did he vow? Yeah, there was. Did, did he build? Do you want, did he want to build the more inclusive membership on Wednesday? I mean, Wednesday's a good day to start doing that. That's when I like to try to integrate my country clubs personal, personally. <laughs> I think what they mean is he said Wednesday he won't resign and vows to build a more inclusive membership, right? White House 65 belongs to the Ida Lewis Yacht Club of New- of Newport, which he did not identify, but was confirmed to the club by the club to Fox News. The news comes after he had been linked to the Bailey's Beach Club, another entity that has faced criticism for seemingly seemingly having no black members, sparking criticism of the progressive politician from constituents in Rhode Island. While I'm not a member of the beach club, I do own a boat and belong to a sailing club in Newport. While this club does not have exclusionary rules for membership, it does lack diversity, White House said in a statement to Fox News. This isn't as interesting as his prior statement, though, about the other club. Oh, there, yeah. Matt, we can see his response to the um, questions about his membership in the Bailey's Beach Club. Right. So he's a member. He's he's a member of one, and then his family's a member of another. I believe. Right. And the and the issue is, I think one one just doesn't have black people, and the other one, I think, has a like a kind of a rule against a commitment black to it. Yeah, a commitment. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, the word he uses is interesting. So let's let's uh, listen to this video. Um, Do you have concerns in 2021? I mean, obviously, it's been four years. You had remarks on the floor following the deaths of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd saying, you know, hoping to root out systemic racism in the country. Um, Your thoughts on an elite, all-white, wealthy club, again, in this day and age, um, you know, should these clubs continue to exist? It's a long tradition in Rhode Island, and there are many of them. (laughs) And uh, I think we just need to work our way through the issues. Thank you. So it's it's. It's a tradition. It's a long tradition, Matt. A it's long a, long, tradition. a long tradition, right? So, there are so many great long traditions that have existed in this country that we definitely want to hold on to. This this is kind of amazing because you know you, you think all the way back to like to the eighties when I don't know Justice Bork had a lease once where there was like a no black people clause in the lease. Like that that was a massive issue, right? Like. 35 years ago or whatever it was. And now right. in the it's middle disqual- of all this disqualifying, right? For the Supreme court. Yeah, exactly. You know, who, who's doing this guy's uh, self scouting for their, yeah. you know, for oppo, you know, saying, are you a member of any all white? Are, are you perchance a member of any right. all white sailing clubs? Like obviously in Rhode Island, that might not be disqualifying for some people. Right. You would think as a member of the Democratic caucus in the Senate that this is something that might want to might have dealt with earlier. It's just kind of amazing it didn't come up before. I think that, that was yeah. my first reaction to this story. Well, it's it's also kind of, what I like about uh, one of the many things I like about this is that he seems so transparent and he seems like he's really doing the work. Right. Mm. Um but he goes, well, I'm not a member of the beach club. I do own a boat. You que- quote this already, but and, and belong to a sailing club in Newport. While this club does not have exclusionary rules for membership, it does lack diversity. 
Failing to address the sailing club's lack of diversity is squarely on me and something for which I'm sorry. I commit to working with the club and the community to build a more inclusive membership and to better connect with the local community. There have been calls for me to resign from the club, which I understand. However, I have no membership to resign, nor will I ask my wife or any other family members to do so. That lack, that last part is a little bit of a con. That, I don't know. That makes me feel like maybe he's not, not being uh, totally genuine and uh, forthcoming in his assessment of this. Yeah, he didn't say it's not like I hang out there every weekend or do I? Yeah, I mean, like, like how often is yeah. he actually there? Or who is he with? I mean, I don't know. It's just also, if it's a bad enough thing for him to. It's just it seems like such a weird like loophole like well i'd love to resign but i can't because I'm, I'm not a member and how dare you suggest that i should ask my family members to resign from this right. racist country club to which i do not belong but right which i'm happy to have them stay members of just right. like pick a, pick a narrative you know what i mean right right exactly i i, I think we also have to address if it's not not an elephant in the room because there's no elephant, nor no elephants in Royal. What's what's a better a animal? Donkey, a donkey in this case because he's them. Uh, maybe yeah, a cormorant. I don't know. You know, I guess we have to ask the question: How would the story have played nationally if this had been a Republican senator? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would be headline news, I assume. Yeah, and like na on a national level, not just the foreign press, not just Daily Mail covering right. it. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, and and this, I think, you know, contributes to a piece of news that we we just got today, which was um, an international survey of trust in media around the world by the Pointer Institute found that the United States, they, they surveyed 92,000 news consumers in 46 countries and found <laughs> the United States ranks last in media trust uh, at 29%. So I, I don't know how much that has to do with this particular story, but I, I will say that uh, the fact that this would probably be leading the news on every broadcast if it were some other member, a member of some other party would, you know, right. it, it factors into the, the situation. That's why you got to come. That's why you got to come to useful idiots, because we bring you the news. It's a no spin zone. That's right. Yeah, we, we, we will give them a, a hard time, maybe even unfairly, no matter what the uh, party they belong to yeah exactly yeah right yeah our contempt is bipartisan our contempt and sensationalism and click hunting right yeah click, it's yeah, not exactly. it's not based on party affiliation whatsoever it's right. it's totally non-denominational so it's totally yeah it's totally non-denominational agnostic even agnostic even yes yeah yeah sheldon Jewish, White House. Right? uh i don't know is he I think so. Shel I, I'm gonna, I always assume a, 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 a man named Sheldon, well, I guess they're not women's named, women named Sheldon, women's, they're not women named Sheldon, but they're Shelly. But I always assume a, a Sheldon is Jewish. Right. I guess but, maybe um, I, 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 on the other, in the other direction, assume that someone named White House is not Jewish. Oh, that's interesting. More like Native American. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> Sheldon lives in White House. Right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, all right. So that was uh, Democrat suck. What do we have for Republican suck? So for Republican suck, I'm just reading at Democracy Now. This is a, this is one of these beautiful things where it's kind of Democrat suck and Republican suck. But um, a fight for democracy. GOP blocks voting bill as Democrats renew push to reform filibuster. Senate Republicans have used the filibuster to block debate on the most sweeping voting rights bill considered by Congress in decades. Every Democrat voted to open debate on the legislation, the For the People Act, but not a single Republican agreed to. For months, Senate Democrats have been trying to reform the filibuster, but they've fallen short due to opposition from two fellow Democrats, Joe Manchin of West Virginia and Kirsten Sinema of Arizona. This all comes as Republican state lawmakers are passing sweeping measures to suppress the vote around the country. According to the Voting Rights Lab, 18 states have enacted more than 30 laws to restrict voting since the November election. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said Tuesday the fight to protect voting rights is not over. Once again, Senate Republicans have signed their names in the ledger of history along Donald, alongside Donald Trump, the big lie, and voter suppression to their enduring disgrace. 
This vote, I'm ashamed to say, is further evidence that voter suppression has become part of the official platform of the Republican Party. Now, Republican senators may have prevented us from having a debate on voting rights today. But I want to be very clear about one thing. The fight to protect voting rights is not over, by no means. In the fight for voting rights, this vote was the starting gun, not the finish line. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell accused the Democrats of trying to stage a power grab by trying to pass the For the People Act. Later today, the Senate will vote on whether to advance Democrats' transparently partisan plan to tilt every election in America permanently in their favor. By now, the rotten inner workings of this power grab have been thoroughly exposed to the light. We know that it would shatter a decades-old understanding that campaign finance law should have a bipartisan referee and turn the Federal Election Commission into a partisan majority cudgel for Democrats to wield against their political opponents. First of all, it sounds like McConnell wrote that with like a thesaurus or was like moved by the spirit. It's so poetic. Isn't the rotten inner workings of this power grab? It's also a weird. I mean, talk about mixed metaphors. Something, you break something this down. cudgel. You studied yeah, you, st you, you studied uh, English, right? That was your major? Mm hmm The Schumer thing was on interesting, too, because something like we're hearing the starting gun, not the finish. It, it was, the, you know, yeah. you, you're expecting to have something the, that you're hearing also at the end and said it was visual. I don't know. Yeah. This vote was the starting yeah. gun, not the finish line. No, I guess that's okay. Okay. So the rotten later inner the workings vote, of this. Yeah. The Senate will vote on whether to advance Democrats' transparently partisan plan to tilt every election in America permanently in their favor. I guess the good part starts here, right? By now, the rotten inner workings of this power grab have been thoroughly exposed to the light. We know we know that it would shudder a decades old shatter. understanding. Shatter. Okay, better. Yeah. Well, we know that it would shatter a decades old understanding that campaign finance law should have a bipartisan referee and turn the Federal Election Commission into a partisan majority cudgel for Democrats to wield against their political opponents. I, I'm, that's, that's fine. I'm all, I'm all for wielding cudgels. I think that's... I guess it's just a weird... I feel like it has a slightly put through Google Translate feel to it. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. We it's know okay. that it would shatter a decades-long old understanding... There's just something odd about it. I mean, mm. then there's the rotten workings of this paragraph, which have been thoroughly exposed to the light. Right. What are rotten inner workings? You know, the the guts of, yeah, I mean, it's hard to have the I know gut, like, guts of a grab. Right, but. exactly, yeah. Yeah, the power grab is a- It works. I mean, come on, you can, you know, we understood what he was talking about. Barely. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't Thomas Friedman. It wasn't when right. we're in three holes. Stop digging. Right. You know? right. But um, the, put the putrid power power grab, the rotting power grab. Right. Right. The power grab that rot. So you, you you were saying that this was both Democrats and Republicans suck. Well, I mean, it's it's Democrats suck because like why can't Schumer get the Dems in, into line? Get the Dems in line. Speaking of the finish line. Yeah, and then it's McConnell. It's the Republicans just suck. I mean, this is not. I'm, I'm going to be honest. It's kind of a boring. Democrats suck. Republicans. Suck. It's kind of boring. Republicans suck. But it's pretty bad. You know, whenever they 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 present voting rights as being partisan. A quick reminder that way back in 2011, there was a proposal to allow a simple majority of senators to break the filibuster. Only a dozen Democrats voted for that. Right. So, you know, they, there have been plenty of opportunities over the over the course of history to to kill the filibuster from on the part of both parties. And they just haven't done it, you know. Yeah. Uh, so this is this is a tool that secretly, I think, basically both parties want to retain. Um, they would rather be in a position to be trapped doing nothing than to be uh, under constant pressure to do something. Right. Not not that I'm in favor of the filibuster in this particular instance. I'm just saying that it's a little bit hypocritical. Yeah, why are the Dems doing that? I, I, I don't totally get it. Like, just so that they are hamstrung? Like, why aren't they all... Why don't all the Dems want to get rid of the filibuster? I don't know. I mean, traditionally, in the last 20 years, they, they have undercut 
any of the sort of legislative ability to act as a check on executive power. Um, but this is one area where they, you know, they, they haven't been particularly aggressive as in undercutting the, the filibuster. But, you know, they're sure against it now. Yeah. The Republicans are, are, are be, being quite open in their sort of desire to use this as a tool to just let the states run rampant with these with these laws. You know, I don't I don't know what to say about it. I mean, I, I, I guess I guess the only way to break this would be to get to get 60 votes in the in the Senate. But that's not going to happen. Right. So because Manchin and Cinema and Schumer. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's another thing about this. So this has become like a talking point that is like omnipresent in uh, all these discussions about all these different legislative sort of proposals and uh, and ambitions that the Democrats purportedly have that it's cinema and mansion awesome. right. who are holding them back. But then you see you, you quietly see, you know, quotes from various staffers saying, you know, if it wasn't for those two, there'd be seven more who, who would step up and, and right. to, to be the to be those votes who would who just wouldn't who would magically not be there in a pinch. And, you know, what we've seen a gazillion times before in the past that, you know, on votes sort of large and small, the when, when it comes to really, really consequential uh, legislative issues the, the Democrats always seems to manage to not quite get the votes, right? And it, it's not right. always Joe Manchin, not always Kirsten Cinema. It's it's the always Philibu somebody. The, the um, parliamentarian. The parliamentarian thing. I mean, there are there are lots of what's in the Dodd Frank bill on amendments there that I remember covering, where they you know they just didn't quite make it, you know, and um, you know that that's a that's a feature of legislating in this era whenever you have corporate interests involved there's always going to be one or two members who are, who are going to play the role of the spoiler and of course it's going to be the ones who have who are going to suffer the least electorally because why would you want to make a person who you know votes in new york or vermont or in some place not well not vermont but new york and or, or some other consequential state where they actually have to deal with uh, angry primary voters. You're not going to make that person be the deciding vote on something like this. Right. But mansion or cinema, you know, they, they can win their votes anyway. So the, they'll be the people who get to be the bad guy in this scenario and they don't care. Now we have that great thumb to down image. We'll always have that from cinema. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Do you think it's hypocritical? Like, do you do you, do you, do, you, do you think if it weren't for cinema and mansion that there would be others? I do. I mean, I assume I kind of assume that the old you know Thomas Frank thesis of listen liberal, right? Which is that Dems always like pretending that they that they're hamstrung. They like right. let themselves be hamstrung. It's not that they like you know. It's not like they love pretending. Dems and and their enablers either pretend or actually think right that they just have their hands tied, but. Really, they're tying their own hands. They show up with one hand tied behind their back, whatever the expression is. Right, right. I mean, it was, somehow we find we find the way to get around all sorts of things when we need to go to war somewhere, right. or we, you know, uh, we need to raise the military budget or whatever it is, or uh, we need to make sure that the budgets for the intelligence agencies are secret, or you know, so, suddenly there's. There's not a problem with finding the votes for those things, but on these issues, it's it's always we just we just couldn't just, quite make just it. Couldn't do it. Just insurmountable. We would love it. We'd love to do it, people. We love it. Right. You hate to see it. You hate to see this stuff happen, but it does. Yeah. What's your What's your feeling about these Republican voter suppression laws? Hmm. You know, I've done a lot of soul searching. I have to come down on against them. Yeah, I haven't done a whole lot of soul searching about them i just i i, I assume that it's just a, a naked ploy to try yeah. to try to well, win we, elections yeah so. we, they've said that remember where was it a couple months ago we did something on this yeah where they actually like said it openly in court decreases their ability to win or something yeah. like that and I, yeah. forget, I forget what the actual quote was yeah but, uh, it's like it's unfair because having more people vote making it easier to vote basically will help the dems so republicans don't like that i think it was the geo what was it the georgia gop or something Something like that. Yeah. It was so notable that I actually remember it. Yeah, I know. That was like a thing that happened on the show that I remember. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, okay. So that was bad. What else do we have? So we have 
Isn't that Here. weird? Okay, we have a good one. I think this, this is this is good sort of food for discussion, fodder for discussion. Yeah. yeah. This is a uh, a story about actor Paul Bettany. He was in *The Beautiful Mind*. Yeah, he he was in uh, the Wimbledon movie. Um, he's in the Marvel Cinematic Universe Avengers series. He he played uh, Ted Kaczynski uh, also in a series. Huh. Uh, and quite well, actually. So here, the story, the headline is, if we, Matt, if we could see it, it's Paul Bettany's children prove that drawing a penis in sun cream is always funny. Uh, I think that's that's something we have to discuss yeah. in a right. minute. Whether or how true that is, yeah. Yeah, so if we, if we scroll down, we see that... Uh, I mean, it, Jesus Christ. It, 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 is, it, is, it is funny, amazing. yeah. That's, I mean, that's, I'm, okay, well, I'm, okay, go ahead. No, I mean, we should just so people who are only watching it are only listening it. Uh, I, I feel like, Matt, you should do the honors in describing the it. The it almost looks like a tattoo because. Right. Yeah. He, he, I'm surprised he, he didn't burn more. He's a Brit. And somehow he managed to kind of tan, not just burn to a crisp. But it's on. How would you describe it? If the, the balls are what above like at the w- level of the waist. Yeah, like below his trapezius muscles, I guess, right? Wow. So, yeah. uh, so he's he's kind of like leaning forward in the like the hunky movie star yeah. pose with his sort of Ray Ban glasses on. Uh, I guess they're not Ray Ban. They're not, yeah. Living, yeah. His sunglasses, yeah. Uh, and and there's just a, a gigantic penis being dr- sort of drawn up the uh, his spine with the balls yeah. sort of below below his shoulder blades. Yeah, uh, and. So the tip is like at the nape of his neck, let's say. Yeah, exactly. And so this the the, the picture raises a lot of questions. Like it's it's posed as if he just somehow wasn't aware that his kids were drawing a penis on his back right. this whole time. Right. Like it, right. like it's a like it's a kick me sign. Yeah. Right. Uh, and I I'm just not buying that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Just to be clear, I mean, I think this is really important. We really want to dig into this. So. It's not like they put it, the the penis outline is the white part. It's the, so the protected from the sun part is the penis outline. Now, had it been that he they had left had the penis part been dark, I would have believed that he didn't know. Because imagine you're putting on a lot of suntan, right? You kind of lose right. That, right. It's all over. You don't know where it is. But to do this, you'd have to actually very sparingly trace. So even forget the penis, forget the content. You know, let's really honor Martin Luther King by actually doing the opposite we're going to focus on the color of the skin and not the content because uh we're looking purely at the the tanning situation then we'll get to the content okay i know martin luther king would is 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 sad that he's not here to that he didn't live to hear his words be applied to a penis suntan uh lotion accident but so if we're looking at just the color right forget the penis part it's just too little suntan lotion applied to not get that something is being drawn onto your back right yeah exactly you know what i'm saying yeah. again if like if we're the other way around it's believable because someone's putting lotion all over but you're you would know in the moment you feel someone tracing something and not putting sunblock anywhere else yeah what but but that also leads me to believe that that's that's not remotely what happened that i, I think they applied suntan lotion all over his back and then, oh, and, and then, then like, went went back and and oh and, right, okay, and do that this, and, and then and then there's this right. whole charade that he was, you know, that Paul Bettany movie star unawares, um, you know, ha- had a penis drawn on his back by his kids in suntan lotion. Um, oh right, I'm so naive. I'm too. I'm I'm not like sneaky enough to figure that out. Matt said said like a man who's who's suntanned many a many a penises onto many a people's back. Right. Yeah, exactly. Now, if you, I think you're right. I think if you were going to do this for real, the way you would have done it is to selectively apply the, the, the lotion <laughs> so that so that what you got. Right. Was a sunburn in the, in the shape of a penis. Right. right. Like that, that would have been really funny. And I think dad would have been actually mad about that because, you know, there's nothing you can do about that. You're going to have a big red penis on your back. You're marked for life or for, for well for long. days for, when i say life i mean the life of a sun tan right yes you're, my, you're marked for life of suntan a couple of days or, yeah or 
burn even yeah yeah exactly yeah. right so uh so the fact that they they did it in this way that was kind of uh i see so you're right. saying they applied it all over and then at some point they like with a piece of wall like what you think they took a nap like a wet towel or they just used their hands to remove some of the sun block no i just think you know they they just reapplied it even more thickly in that in that area around the right uh oh i see okay now i'm getting it right okay i get it so they applied the sunblock to the whole back and then they take an extra dollop of dollop, dollop extra yeah. dollop and put it out i see and at that point you don't realize because you have it all over you feel like maybe they're just doing a little like curly cue of a uh, whatever massage type thing right but he knows he knows what's going on because he thinks it's funny because his, his kids are doing it anyway do you think he was like what, what, what about a penis if you could do it in the shape of a penis that would be hilarious <laughs> you okay. think that's what his accent sounds like i, was... I don't know no 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 he's probably more proper than that right yeah i would think he's more down nabby than that yeah than than cockney although yeah. cockney sorry it's terrible yeah. i can't believe i even said that but well yeah. like, we can say yorkie right like i don't think yorkie. He's... yeah yeah um all right, so the story says co comedy always changes with the times, but one thing's for sure: penis drawings will never not be funny. I, it's probably true, right? I think we can. Get I think so. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're gonna we're gonna look into that actually in a second. So, but yeah. Proving that point, um, are Paul Bettany's children who have brought back the genius draw a penis on your dad's back with sun sun cream joke. Um, I guess that's the thing, right? So, like, bring uh, your daughter to work day, draw a penis on your dad's back day with sun cream. With sun cream, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the uh, 50 year old has shared snaps from uh, a past holiday in Ibiza, uh, where children Stellan 17 and Agnes 10 were on hand to help him apply his sunscreen. I'm assuming if you have a 17 year old kid and they're drawing something on your back, you probably know what's up. Right. Anyway, um, and you know, leave an outline of genitalia on his back. The Marvel star posts a picture of himself sitting at a boat cabin before gazing out over the sea with a rather crude drawing on his back uh, in dripping sun cream. He captioned the post, uh, things change as you get older and it can be really helpful when your kids become adults and are able to help you apply your sunscreen, LOL. Uh, his Marvel co-star Jeremy, Jeremy Renner le left a string of laughing emojis and wrote, I love your kids, while Kate Beckinsale commented, want to like this 10 times. I guess the only question is like, is it okay if that picture's staged or not? Isn't that staged, right? Yeah. I mean, do you think that there's gonna be some bad news? I feel like, is this some kind of di distraction from something? Like, are we gonna find out he is having an affair or like? Well, um, Kate Beckinsale did like the, the penis 10 times. Oh, whoa. She did want to like it 10 times. Whoa. How many, did she like it at all? Uh, I don't know. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, maybe there's something there. All right. Yeah. So Paul Bettany's kids drew a penis on his back, and I don't, and we don't think it was, um, we don't think it was inadvertent or, or yeah. that he didn't notice. But it was funny anyway. Uh, so what do we have for? Um, isn't that terrible? So for isn't that terrible? I mean, okay, take your pick. Do you want a penis? Do you want a penis pick, or do you want a non-penis pick? Go for the penis pick. Whatever. Always when in doubt. Okay. Cause you know, Matt, I believe you said it's always um, it's always funny when there's a penis uh, image involved. We're gonna see if how funny it is right now. This it seems more terrible than it is. Botched because there's so many botched penis stories that really do tug your heartstrings. You know, pull at your heartstrings. And at, at the at your what what did um McConnell say? Your innards. What is it? Uh, the inner workings. The, the inner workings. Yeah. Yeah, that really rot your inner workings, but. Botched pothole repair that looks like giant penis mocked by locals. Oh, so, come on. Oh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. So p parents have slammed a botched council repair job that left a pothole near a primary school looking like a giant penis. And I guess for them, it's not. I mean, it is funny, but uh, it looks like at first it looks like a weird like icicle. It, it looks like someone made the, like an, the opposite of a snowman. Like there's a lot of the theme of the show is like the inversion or the yeah the, I mean if you look at it from a oh, different it's like angle our, our statue that yeah it looks you, negative, you can make it into space. like the into a Freud thing right like you have little glasses and that could be like a beard oh yeah clothes. oh yeah yeah actually we should Wilson can we tweet this out and ask people to interpret it we'll do like a little Warshark test on it 
because now I'm seeing it as a, it could be a penis. It could also be a man in profile, like a Fred Flintstone face. You see that? Like looking to the left. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. And then looking with like a little rubber ducky coming towards him. Could be a crane. A crane. Yeah. It could be a blimp that blimp. has one wing, like one wing <laughs> blimp. <laughs> No, I don't know about the winged blimp. <laughs> One winged blimp. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not seeing the winged blimp. What else, what else could it be? A chicken. It's. A, let's see. A chicken. A drumstick. Cross. Looks like a sledge. Um, not a sledge. A, a buzz saw. A chainsaw or something. Yeah, it's got. Something. It's kind of got. It looks like a Jim Dine painting. It's kind of. It's. It's like a, a. Not a painting. A drawing. Like a. Yeah. It's some kind of. Some kind of tool. Yeah. It looks like a pop or a popsicle, like one way. It looks like a popsicle with some kind of skewer, some with, with something skewering it. So what happened in the story? Uh, let's see. Let's scroll it down. Uh, the, 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 the council, the county council said it was not possible to complete a neat repair. <laughs> Residents were delighted when Lancashire County Council said it would finally fix the gaping holes littering Devonshire Drive in Clayton more but after contractors were called to fill them in locals said it was left looking worse than ever martin perry posted a video of the scene near saint mary's primary school with the disgruntled comment my kids could have done better one person replied absolutely disgusting worse than ever i wouldn't like to put my name to that mess wonder what that's cost the taxpayers well first of all though it's not like artists sign it's not like people who fill potholes sign their work it's kind of a weird statement uh, people who make potholes they don't sign yeah, their work i don't think no. so they should no because it's it, a gradual overtime kind of process right yeah yeah so uh another wrote one of them even looks like a giant penis uh clear nurdad aziz of hindberg borough council agreed telling mr perry on social media i will visit the area today as it is not acceptable in my opinion a spokesperson for Langshard County Council told the Langshard Telegraph a neat repair was not permissible due to the road's poor condition. The spokesperson said Devonshire Road is in poor condition and will be put forward alongside other priorities for consideration as part of next year's surf resurfacing program. In the meantime, we will continue to make any repairs which may be needed to keep the surface in safe condition. The poor structural condition of the road means that the approach we usually take where the area around the pothole is cut out to create a neat repair is not possible. So you know what? Life isn't always perfect things don't always work out and sometimes you're stuck with a penis shaped pothole repair why don't they just um sort of create a bigger pothole in a different shape yeah like just make it totally round maybe they just don't have the resources i, I mean do you need how many how many how much resources do you need to make a pothole i mean i think they're being well this is interesting what what okay now we're getting to what the, the real story was this intentional was this like vandal penis shaped vandalism? No, I think it or happened they, organically. This is God happening. This is joking. I joked, but so why not fix it though? That's what I'm wondering about. Because it's because because of that, right? right? So the people are resisting because now, oh, it's like the 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 Mary on the um. Yeah, it's like the face the of napkins, Jesus that appears Jesus, in, the, like, yeah. in the tree stump, kind of a thing. Right. So I guess they can't take it away now, but they're pretending it's because they don't have the resources. I think they don't want to take it away. Right. I think they, it's funny. Yeah. Right. So they, yeah. they had they had a re, they had a meeting before the council and they said, let's just say we don't have the resources to do right. it. And they were getting high at the same time. Right. Let's just say, let's just say we don't have the money. All right. So we're going to talk to Dr. Norwin Finkelstein, who um, uh, I think is is even is even more roundly disapproved of than we are. Really excited to be bringing on to the show, making his Useful Idiots show debut, Norman Finkelstein. Norman Finkelstein received his PhD from the Princeton University Politics Department in 1988. He is the author of 11 books that have been translated into 50 foreign editions, including The Holocaust Industry, Reflections on the Exploitation of Jewish Suffering, and Gaza, An Inquest into Its Martyrdom. You can find out more about Norman Finkelstein at normanfinkelstein.com. He is a frequent uh, critic of the Israeli government. He humiliated uh, Alan Dershowitz through debates and um, writing about him. He is the son of Holocaust survivors 
And we're so excited that we get a sneak preview into his book on cancel culture, which is not yet finished, but he was kind enough to send us a manuscript. And without further ado, let's talk to Norman Finkelstein. Welcome to the show, Mm -hmm. Professor Finkelstein. It's lovely to see you again. We're very lucky. We're very blessed because we kind of have a sneak preview into your into the manuscript of your new book. Um, can you tell us the uh, what made you write the book in the first place before we get into actually into the actual meat of it? Yeah, well, actually, it's close to the heart of your show. When, it is actually, yeah. yeah. When the Harper's letter came out denouncing cancel culture, my um, publisher, Colin Robinson, mentioned to me that my name came up with some frequency because I had been effectively canceled, but I was canceled not by the so-called left, I was canceled by the right. And he thought I should uh, say something about that matter. Now it happened that a few years ago, I had written two chapters of a book uh, on academic freedom, which I never published because I, couldn't find a wherewithal to complete the last two chapters. So it just sat in my folder on my email. So I said to Colin, well, actually I have written something in academic freedom, which is very relevant to this topic of council culture. He said, great, uh, I'll publish it. Just write an introduction. So I said, how many words? And he said about 3000. I said, Colin, I can't do it. I'm focused on something else right now. I was writing stuff on the International Criminal Court and the uh, Palestine complaint before the court. It's very technical, minutia, and my mind was deeply immersed in it. I said, Count, I can't write 3,000 words. That's a lot of words for me, and it would just take me too much time. Uh, Well, he was more insistent than usual. And so I start, and what began as 3,000 words, I think, is now about 100,000. 100, wow. <laughs> so that's the, the genesis of the book. But the other part of the book, the other odd part of the book was Colin wanted me to write it to make the point that it's the right that's the real cancel culture. And of course, I end up writing that the real problem is the left, Colin. Right. It's not the right. I mean, obviously, there's cancel culture on the right. But the point is, the cancel culture on the right, or the mainstream, the establishment, whatever you want to call it, for a person of the left, that's a given. Right. That's a part of what it means to be in the left. You're going to be the true left. You're going to be marginalized. You're going to be ignored. That's the history of the left. You know, the, nobody, I think, would seriously dispute that the foremost intellectual of the second half of the 20th century was Noam Chomsky. Chomsky wrote literally, literally scores of books on politics. You never saw him on the talk show, mm. a, a talking head show. It was unthinkable. You'd never see him in the New York Times. You'd never see him after the 1960s. You'd never see him in the New York Review of Books. He was a non-person. Now, you can be angry at that. You can be indignant at that. You can want to protest that. But you're not surprised. (laughs) That's how the system works. What changed with the cancel culture was that it now also started to engage in fair, I should say what changed was on the left, on the left, they start to not just engage in fairly promiscuous canceling of people, but there was a whole kind of justification for it, which, and not entirely, one has to be careful about this, not entirely, but in certain respects, I think was unprecedented. 
Uh, and so if you're a person of the left. Unprecedented in America. Uh, yes. Well, you know, look, one would be engaging a, a large amount of denial. On the communist left, there was an awful lot of canceling of people. You know, they were declared enemies of the Soviet Union. And there was all sorts of canceling going on. So we shouldn't deny that the left, the left culture intersects with the civil libertarian uh, culture. They intersect, but they do not overlap. One has to be clear about that. It's true. A senior member of the American Communist Party, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, she was also a founding member of the ACLU. And it is also true that the communist, uh, le communist left depended in significant part in fighting First Amendment freedom of speech issues. So if you look at the history of the First Amendment as it went to the Supreme Court, most of the cases having to do with freedom of speech had to do with communists, leftists, trying to defend the turf, the terrain of freedom of speech. So there is an intersection there. There's no question about it. But on the other hand, an overlapping, no. When the government wanted to lock up Trotskyists, uh, the 1939, the Dice Committee, committee uh, Paul Robeson supported it. He said the Trotskyists are fascist collaborators, so on and so forth. He won't vote for the Trotskyists. So there was a, you know, a communist party line, and you can't say they were, can't even say they were in any way really defenders of freedom of speech in principle. They were defenders of freedom of speech of the communist party. So, but there are aspects which, at least the part of the left that I came to identify with, uh, the council culture clearly conflicted with it. And, and that to me was the problem. The problem was not the right, not because the problem, not because the right isn't a problem. Of course, it's a problem. Not just the right, the mainstream. I mean, when I talk about people who were canceled, people like Noam Chomsky, they weren't, you know, canceled by uh, the John Birch Society. They were canceled by the New York Times, the whole liberal press, the whole liberal press. They were canceled by. So of course, that's a problem. But I'm speaking as a person of the left. And for me, the problem really begins when the left itself starts engaging in a culture which we decry, decry when it's practiced by liberals and people further to the right. So we're criticizing, we criticize that culture, but now we're internalizing its norms, the right to decide what's true, the right to repress what is offensive. Um, those values to me are important, the values of truth and liberty of speech. Uh, and when I it started to appear on in the left, I took strong exception to it, both because it's repressive, but less because it's in repressive than because it preempts a serious pursuit of truth. Uh, too many taboos, too many fences, and the pursuit of truth becomes subordinate to the defense of what feels good, mm. became a feel-good priority over whether something is true or not. And one of the, I'm going to just cut to the chase here, and you'll excuse me, I hope. One of the very refreshing things 
about reading W. E. B. Du Bois, which is one of my was one of my undertakings as I wrote this book. I sat down and read, I would say, probably about eight volumes of the boys. And the thing I like most reading the boys, oh, there are many things you have to like about reading the boys. He's just a very smart guy. He's a very serious guy. He was a very hard working guy. From the time he entered college, and then he studied at Harvard, and then he studied at the University of Berlin, and then uh, he ended his professional life. He put in of just pristine work, not small talk, just work. Uh, he put in solid nine and a half hour days. He had, he kept to a very rigorous rigorous schedule. At 10 p.m., he went right to bed, no matter what. He would attend meetings, you know, public meetings. And the meetings, you know, of the left, they go on and on and on and on and on. At around nine o'clock, he got up, got to go home to bed. He was very disciplined, rigorous. Um, but the thing, one of the things I liked about him most, there were many, uh, just the sheer insight, the breadth of knowledge. But it was the fact that he always looked for the hardest argument, not the easy argument, not the straw man. And he would, uh, a typical Du Bois packet, pa passage, it occurs over and over again. He'll say, he'll take the question of crime statistics, that there's high crime in African-American areas. And he would say, yes, the, the, the statistic is false in this way, the statistic is misleading in this way. The statistic is incorrect in this way. And he'll go over all the arguments to dispose of the crime statistics. But then he always used the same phrase. The phrase was, he begins the sentence, and yet, comma, and yet we have a crime problem in the black community. Let's not pretend it's not there. It's there. It's not something we should run from. It's not something we should be ashamed of. It's not something that undermines us fundamentally as a people. It can be explained. It can be understood why there is that problem. It's not something that impacts on our, on our humanity as a people. These have rational explanations. And so he always confronted the hard argument. You can't do that nowadays mm, right. in the identity politics cancel culture. You're not allowed to say there are real problems there. He would discuss things like he'd say, yes, because you know he wrote quite a lot in Africa. And he would say, yes, there is cannibalism there. There is, and he would go through all sorts of unpleasant things to have to acknowledge. But then he would say, here is a plausible explanation of why it's so. It doesn't make us lesser of human beings. And he would describe the kinds of brutalities and say uh, penal punishment that existed in Europe at the same time as, you know. So he would show we don't exactly have a, a, a glorious record either when it comes to uh, the uh, abuse, the, phys the violent physical abuse of human beings. Always, yes, it's true. This is not true. This is not true. This is not true. Same thing he did with the black family. He talked very forthrightly about pathologies at his time in the black family. And he would say, you can trace this back to slavery. You can trace that back to the fact that there's few employment opportunities. And he would go through it piece by piece by piece. And so there was always the and yet, and yet. There's a problem here. And sometimes he was actually quite interesting. 
he said, yes, there's a certain amount of uh, sexual, I don't think he would use the word promiscuity, I can't remember. But then he would have said, uh, I think black people have a healthier attitude towards sex than white people. And he would go, but he wouldn't just say it glibly. He was a very serious scholar. He explains it rigorously, methodically, comparatively. And that to me is a sign of a healthy intellectual culture. Never fleeing facts, never afraid of them because he has enough confidence in Africans and African-Americans in their intrinsic humanity. He's confident enough of it that he's not afraid to confront these questions because he's confident I can give you a perfectly rational explanation for it. It's the people who don't have the confidence, who are filled with doubt, who are the first ones to repress because they repress because they fear they can't answer. They fear they can't answer. If you take the best scholars in the Nazi Holocaust, people like Raoul Hilberg, he was very laid back about Holocaust deniers. He said sometimes they asked interesting questions. Sometimes they came up with interesting facts because Hilberg knew the Nazi Holocaust happened. He had no doubt about that. There was no fear in him just like there was no fear in the boys about the humanity of black people. So he didn't run away, quite the contrary. Hilberg always expressed a curiosity. And sometimes he said, you know, the Holocaust deniers at this point or that point, they actually had a point. They had a point. They contributed to knowledge. The overall picture, of course they got wrong. But here, there, there, they have something of interest to say. So my point is, when you are confident in your knowledge, you don't fear the challenges. You don't fear the naysayers because you know, I can answer that. Right, I can shut them down. Just, I can provide a rational, lucid explanation. It's the ones who don't have the knowledge who are the ones that are quick to repress, not because they believe what the other person is saying is not <laughs> true. They're not repressing it because they think it's untrue. They're repressing it because they fear they can't answer it. So does it, there's another theme that, that runs through your book that uh, is something that we've also talked about a lot um, on this show, which is this idea of using the sort of new language around race and race, race discussions to suppress larger questions that the left might be tackling, particularly the campaign of Bernie Sanders. You mentioned in a chapter about Kimberly Crenshaw that she's quoted in a New York Times article very sort of strategically. I'll read the quote, uh, it's, it's, and it's about Sanders, where she says, you basically have a moment where every corporation worth its salt is saying something about structural racism and anti-Blackness, and that stuff is even out distancing what candidates in the Democratic Party were actually saying. And this was essentially used as, Katie, a cudgel to uh, suppress uh, what Sanders' criticisms of corporate America, this idea that cor corporations were sort of more racially ahead of where the Democratic Party was, so let's leave them alone. It, 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 can you talk a little bit about what you were trying to say in this? Well, uh, it wasn't just Kimberly Crenshaw, although she was mm -hmm. obviously egregious in that respect. It was, it was Ta-Nehisi Coates. Kendi, yeah. It was, well, I don't think Kendi spoke, I, to my knowledge, I could be mistaken, but I don't think uh, Kendi directly spoke out against Bernie Sanders. Tanda Hesey Coates did in 2016. Yeah. Angela Davis. The most revealing thing about, in my opinion, the most revealing thing about the identity politics and the cancel culture, the most politically revealing was the very same precincts 
that were most rah-rah identity politics, cancel culture, Black Lives Matter, and all the rest. The very same people, the very same venues, the very same organs, the very same precincts were the ones in 2020 and 2016 who most viciously went after Bernie Sanders. That to me is the most revealing, that's the, 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 the salient and the most telling fact about identity politics. Who are the biggest, most vicious in their attacks or in their canceling of Bernie Sanders? It was the New York Times, it was MSNBC, the very same precincts who are holding high the banner of identity politics, trans people, black, lesbian, trans, Jewish, the very same people who are holding Holding high that banner, they were attacking with a vengeance and with such viciousness Bernie Sanders and the Bernie Sanders campaign, you know, to the points of, you know, pretty lunatic. It was Sidney Embers of the New York Times who yeah. for won for the whole campaign. Every sentence began Bernie Sanders, who had a heart attack, was seen last <laughs> after yeah. his heart attack. But when he was yeah. seen last week, it still seemed as if he might be suffering from the heart attack. Yeah, which she's is, the worst. Which is perfectly understandable because Bernie Sanders had a heart attack. I mean, that's right. what her columns read like for six uh, for six months. And then there were people like Joy Reid, who have a on a body language reader. Language specialist, yes. Yeah, to prove that who Bernie talks? Sanders is a and it was lunatic. Yeah, and they talked about his physicality, his physicality, right. which anyone, it's amazing because all these people who talk about power dynamics and language and tropes, and they talk about his physicality, a Jewish guy's physicality, yeah. and how he turtles and his eye level. I mean, it was so disgusting. I couldn't but, believe it. You know, but you are Sorry. reading also super identity politics. That's what I'm saying. Right, 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 right. The same people. Because the whole yeah. purpose at that point, identity politics have been appropriated by the Democratic Party as a weapon to stop Bernie Sanders. And also it became a weapon, not a weapon, it became a counterpoint to Trump because Trump was able to bring out large crowds. He can have large rallies. It was quite clear Biden was not capable of that. And so the ruling elites, the, the portion of the ruling elites, they then decided to ride the tiger of the Black Lives Matter movement because it served as a mass counterpoint to the mass base that Trump was able to summon. And then so for a significant period of time, the New York Times is Black Lives Matter, all you know, 24-7 uh, in, in the paper. But that was an effort to harness the energy of the Black Lives Matter movement to counter the obvious energy that Trump's committed base brought to his campaign. But it was um it mostly functioned. Uh, you take the case of Robin D'Angelo. What does Robin D'Angelo's whole shtick mean? Her whole shtick comes down to black people should never trust any white people. Don't trust any white person because lurking in their minds, now this is her speaking, not me. Lurking in their minds, all black people are gorillas. That's what she says. That's what she says, lurking in their minds. So don't trust them. They may be out there with you in the Black Lives Matter movement. They may be marching with you. They may be sacrificing with you, but don't trust any of those white people. And what's her message to white people? Her message to white people is every white person, every white person from a white a person like in my neighborhood who's laying out in the street because he or she is homeless, uh, which are quite a lot in my neighborhood, Every white person from bad person to Jeff Bezos, they all profit from racism. 
So the message to white people is, uh, be careful what you're willing to give up because you're benefiting from this system. Every white person benefits from the system. So if you let them climb one rung higher, you are going to go one rung lower. So it's a, a warning to white people to be cautious, careful, wary of this black, uh, uh, the demands of black people. And it's also a deflection so, for the CEOs, right? Like you, you wrote yeah. this, uh, for Jeff Bezos, D'Angelo's message is a godsend. It not only divides Amazon workers against each other, it also lets him personally off the hook as in, hey, I'm not the problem. Uh, don't you hear, Robin? It's all we whites who are making life miserable for black people. We're all guilty. We're all sinners. In other words, it's sort of not the CEOs who are doing the, who are the problem. It's all, all white us. people. Right. All of us. Man. And then they, the CEOs, they get to play the enlightened ones Man. because they give money to Black Lives Matter. They give uh grants to people like Kendi, 10 million dollars the head of twitter gave him to start up an anti-racism center at boston university uh and uh, we don't even have to talk about the money they gave to patrice cullers tamara uh tamika mallory and the others from black lives matter so they come off as the enlightened white people people like jeff bezos and so the problem is not Bezos, because yes, he benefits from uh, racism, but we all benefit from it, except Be Bezos, he's trying to fight it. He's giving money to Black Lives Matter. He's giving money to Ibram X. Kendi. It's those white workers who are so backward. They don't give any money. They're not fighting racism. So it's not only that it lets Bezos off the hook because he can say, we're all the problem. It's actually even more insidious because they give the donations, they give the money, and then they get to be the good white guys. They get to be the good white guys. The real problem is those white workers who don't give any money and show no enlightenment and no remorse whatsoever. They're the problem. And to hear the rest of this interview with Norman Finkelstein, where we talk about a lot of uh, hot topics and controversial topics, please become supporters of the Substack at usefulidiots.substack.com. As always, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes, subscribe on YouTube, youtube.com slash usefulidiots. Use the hashtag useful idiots pod on Twitter. Uh, that was great, huh? It was, I actually, I'm sad that the book's not going to be out for a while. I, 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 I chewed through that book uh, I in this, this morning and, and um, it's really w wittily written. I know, it's and, really and, funny. Like brutally honest. I, I think, I think one of the things is like, if you, if you spend too much time reading sort of pop culture and you know or journalism, you get used to this kind of like dullness of mind, and right. you're and you're not used to people just just saying saying the absolute brutal truth. Yeah, uh, right. and and especially doing it in a way that's like erudite and um, mellifluous and all those things on the yeah. page. So it's it, it's terrific. It's I, I was really I was, I was yeah. actually really surprised. Right. So um, yeah. yeah, that's and look, I mean. Uh, he got pre-canceled, so in a way he can say whatever he wants. Yeah, well, no, it's it gives you carte blanche at that point. Yeah, exactly, so. yeah. And that's a whole other show. We'll have to do a whole other show about his getting, basically being denied tenure because of a fight with Alan Dershowitz. Well, it, it's a badge of honor, isn't it? I know, yeah. it's the best, yeah. Yeah, it's funny yeah. that he, he and I share a publisher, so it's... Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, I, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, All right, yeah, well, that was cool. Uh, yeah. thanks, thanks for tuning in, and, uh, and we will... Uh, see you next week, I guess. Yep. Yeah, see you next week. All right, excellent. Awesome.